So, uh, welcome to Leduma Part 2. And uh, as you learned last week and again this morning, the word Leduma is the Zulu word for goal. And uh, it actually literally translates to it thunders. Would you just say that with me? Say it thunders. Okay, you're going to get some practice just now. It actually declares that something immense has, has actually taken place or happened. So last week I had the privilege and the responsibility to start talking to you as the church about our goals for the 2015-2016 season. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't here last week, you can go to our website, you can listen to the message, part one of Leduma, or you can go to our info bar after the service and you can order the DVD or the CD because we won't have time to recap on everything that we shared. I want you to know as well, you can go to our website, go to the resource page, and you can download this coming year's uh, goals, but also you can get a hold of our mission and our vision. As a matter of fact, I think our uh, media guys have done a great job. If you just uh, type in rscfc.com forward slash vision, it will actually bring the goals and the vision planning program up as well, so you can start setting your own goals and your own program. So we're going to talk about this morning scoring goals for the kingdom. As a matter of fact, someone once said the word goals uh, uh, significantly, significantly means the following. Godly objectives assure lasting success. Godly objectives assure lasting success. And so I want you to know that we do have a mission as a local church. Last week we took the time to read our mission statement out together. Now, I, I'm a little bit afraid that some of you didn't bring your, your vision programs back with you. And so we only gave to the people that weren't here last week. So I'm going to take a minute and just read it for you this morning. Rama South Coast Family Church exists to support and extend the kingdom of God by proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve all by every effective means available to us and by equipping our family to do the same. As a matter of fact, we arrived at this mission statement after a journey we went on for several years and uh, we found this scripture to encapsulate or to communicate the heartbeat of our church. It's 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 19. Now, I want to read it for you, if I can, this morning by way of introduction. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And so our, our uh, mantra or our catchphrase as a local church is at your service. We believe today that as a church we are at God's service. We are here to serve God with all our hearts. We believe that as a team of volunteers we are here to serve our congregation and our community. And we really believe today that we are all to serve one another. That's holding uh, the heartbeat of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So on the count of three, can we just say that out nice and loud, especially for those who are visiting this morning. Let's say it with belief. Let's say it with passion this morning. On the count of three, we're going to declare at your service. Is that okay with you? One, two, three. All right, now that wasn't too bad for a Sunday morning, but I really believe this is the group this morning that I'm focusing on. I can see you guys are alive this morning. Am I right? Okay, so let's try it together. One, two, three. Yeah, just what I thought. You guys are on fire. These guys that are sleeping, maybe you want to prove us wrong. Uh, on the count of three. One, two, three. All right. I, uh, yes. <laughs> Someone was really determined to uh, let us know about that. Well, well, we'll just focus on everyone for now. Uh, I won't turn my pulpit this way just yet. Uh, let's, let's, see, let's see how we go. Notice something very significant about this verse of Scripture, though. Paul declares three very powerful truths just in this one verse. Number one, he declares his absolute belief that in Christ Jesus he is free. 
He is free from all men. He is free to serve God with everything that he has. So he understood that he wasn't serving God because of what man was doing or because someone told him to. He was free to do whatever he wanted to because he was born again. I hope you realize this morning you are free. Number two, he makes the statement. He says, I have made myself a servant. That tells me he made a quality decision. He made a choice in his life that he was going to be a servant to everyone. It's not something that happens automatically. You've got to make a decision to be a servant. And number three, he says, the reason I make myself a servant this morning is because I want to win people to Christ. The reason we are servants this morning is because we want to lift up the name of Jesus. We want to make the name of Jesus great. Can you say amen? Look at the person next to you and say, at your service. So this morning I want to take the opportunity today to talk to you about teamwork. As a matter of fact, the great uh, uh, once pastor and now leadership guru has written uh, 50, 60 different books. John Maxwell coined this phrase, Teamwork makes the dream work. I believe we could say it like this. Teamwork makes the church work. Can you say amen? And I want to talk to you about the significance of teamwork. As a matter of fact, uh, our theme, La Duma, which speaks about thundering or scoring goals, I want you to know every soccer game, every soccer team that wants to win, makes it a priority in their life to score goals. As a matter of fact, that's what they need to do if they're going to win. They, they often want to hear the commentator saying, La Duma! Maybe we should practice that this morning. Uh, come on, let, let's try this group over here together on the count of three. Come on, let, let's allow that word to express our passion this morning. One, two, three. La Duma! Woo! It is thundering in here this morning. Uh, uh, let's, let's move on. Uh, as we go on this morning. Do you guys want a chance as well? Okay. On the count of three. One, two, three. Well, you weren't as loud, but you were much more passionate. Very good. So we see a winning team needs to score goals. And I want you to know, without teamwork, you can have the best striker in the world. Without teamwork, I want you to know you might score some goals, but you're not going to win every game. As a matter of fact, if a team is going to win, it not only needs to score goals, I want you to know it's got to have a great defensive system. It's got to have a, a, an excellent midfield. As a matter of fact, if you know anything about soccer, the game often is won and lost in the midfield by your midfield players who can control and link between your defense and your striking. What are we saying this morning? A winning soccer team is a soccer team that learns to work together in unity as a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. So today, I want to ask you if you would, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 6. And we're going to look at one of the greatest stories of teamwork and accomplishing goals that's ever been written. Uh, I want to start this morning, if you would give me permission, I want to start sort of at the end of the story. and We're going to kind of live the story backwards uh, to the start of the story because when we get to the start of the story, that's where we've got to begin. How many of you have got to begin at the start if you want to see results in your life? So we're going to start at the end and we're going to kind of read the story backwards, if you like. Here in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, we see the end of the first segment of Nehemiah's life. It says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days, and it happened when our enemies heard it, and the nations around saw these things. They were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by God. Now the reason they were disheartened was everyone around Jerusalem did not want to see Israel succeed. And I want you to know that the city of Jerusalem lay in absolute ruins until Nehemiah came along and he rallied the troops together. And with, a, with an incredible level of leadership and passion, he brought a team together and in just 52 days, they completed the rebuilding of the walls. Historians tell us that it was almost a near impossible task, firstly to rebuild the walls because they didn't have all the resources at hand, but secondly to do it in 52 days was nothing short of incredible. 
Now, in the year 1424 BC, Nehemiah served King Artaxerxes as a cupbearer. He had a position of great trust. And I want you to know he would not only advise the king, but he would ensure that the king wasn't poisoned. As a matter of fact, if for some reason the king was poisoned, the next person to die would be Nehemiah. Because it would have meant that he had failed the king and the nation. He showed an amazing self-sacrifice, an incredible servanthood or volunteer spirit when he literally gave up the luxury of the palace the prestige that he had received for the position he held, and he literally asked for leave so he could go to Jerusalem and get dirty rebuilding the walls. It speaks about the price that people are willing to pay. And so uh, my first point this morning that I want to make, and if you can work with me this morning as we speak about teamwork, I'm going to give you some keys to teamwork in the kingdom of God. The first statement I want to make though is this, if we will build the church, people will come. If we will build the church, people will come because I want you to know we're living in a world today where people are broken, people are distressed, there's trouble out there, and I want you to know the church has the answer. As a matter of fact, the church is the hope of the world. Isn't it wonderful that we could come this morning and worship together and rally together and enjoy the corporate presence of God? That we could be part today of a miracle in people's lives as they received healing from Jesus, as we received encouragement. How many of you came here this morning and you're feeling better than when you arrived here? Can I see your hand? Please put up your hand, somebody. I mean, I, I'm, I'm excited. I've preached myself happy because the presence of God comes and it lifts your spirit. Can you say amen? So here's the first key to teamwork. Passion and compassion are always the springboard to obedience. Passion and compassion. As a matter of fact, if you read the life of Nehemiah, he was so moved, he was moved to tears, he was moved to fasting and prayer when he visited his, when he visited his family in Jerusalem and realized that they were living in dire circumstances. The walls were broken down. Nothing was happening. They had no protection. They were living in desperate conditions. And he was moved with a passion and compassion to say, this is our God that we are serving and it should not be like this. Look at the person next to you and say, let's build. And that's why we're here this morning. We not only want to build people to grow in Christ, but we want to finish our building so that we can draw more people to Christ. How many of you know we don't want to just serve our family, but we want to have an influence in our community? Because I want you to know when you have an influence in the community, when things go wrong, when things happen, God can use you to make a difference in people's lives. Many of you won't know this, but uh, you know the... the, the, uh, Terrible situation around the State of the Nation address and the things that went down. I mean, we all see the news and the media, but what we don't see is that Pastor Ray was behind the scenes meeting with the President, meeting with the Speaker of the House, meeting with Julius Malema personally in his home, speaking life and peace and healing and saying, come on, we've got to restore if we want to build this nation. You see, people, they don't put that on the news, but I want you to know the reason that Rhema can do that is because when you build the church and when you work together with a heart of service, God opens doors so that you can influence. Look at the person next to you and say, let's build. I want you to know we want to be a church that makes a difference. I want you to know if our church ever closed down, we want to be sure that the community would miss us. Are you okay with me this morning? All right, number two, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 3. We're going to be quick this morning. I have 87 points, and if we move quickly, we can be out of here before 6 o'clock. Come on, look at the person next to you. Let's work together. Okay, I'm just joking. Just joking. It's 65 points, all right. Nehemiah 5 verse 3. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards, and our houses, that we might buy grain because of the famine. If you go read Nehemiah chapter 5, you'll see that 
Nearly everybody that rallied around Nehemiah to help him to build the walls of Jerusalem, they were in desperate times. They didn't have lots of money. They didn't have resources. As a matter of fact, in the whole nation and the known world at that time, there was a famine. So my next statement I want to make is this. The mission that Nehemiah undertook was undertook in the peak of famine and oppression. So we might stand here today, maybe we're living on the south coast, maybe it's not, the, it's not Santon, which in one square mile is the richest uh, square mile in the whole of Africa. We might not be positioned in that square mile, but I want you to know that doesn't mean God can't work. That doesn't mean God's arm is shortened. It doesn't mean God is unable to accomplish what He said He will accomplish. Don't let what you're going through stop you from being the person God created you to be. Right in the midst of the famine, Nehemiah undertook this task and he said, we will accomplish it not because we're anything, but because the hand of our God is upon us. Church, stop looking at your circumstances and saying, well, I can't do this. No, you can. Because when God is on your side, the greatest difficulties will not stop you from enjoying the victory. Bump the person next to you and say, that was for you this morning. You might say this morning, you, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't know my husband. No, I don't, but God does. You might be sitting here saying, Pastor, I can't do it. You don't know my wife. I don't know your wife and I probably don't want to, but let's pray for her anyway. I'm just joking. Um, you might be here this morning and you say, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm too short. And over here you might be sitting and say, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm too tall. And over there you might be saying, Pastor, you don't understand, my nose is too big. People laugh at me and I no, no, there is no excuse this morning, church. It's time to rise up and let's build the church. Can you say amen? You all know my, my favorite joke. The, 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 this church was packed full and the preacher was about to get up to preach this most incredible sermon. The atmosphere was electrifying and suddenly Satan walks in. I mean, everybody began to scatter. Within minutes, the church emptied through the windows, through the doors. I mean, they were just running everywhere. And Satan went to stand up on the stage and he looked up and the church was empty except for one gentleman sitting on the third row. And he looked at this gentleman and he said, Ah, oh, why are you still here? Aren't you scared? Don't you know who I am? The gentleman calmly looked up and said, No, I don't. I'm not scared of you at all. I know who you are. I've been married to your sister for years. <laughs> That's not prophetic, it's just a joke. <laughs> okay, key number two. Key number two. To fulfill God's will and God's plan and God's purpose, we must learn to work together and each of us need to do our part. Church, don't let the, the scales of, of darkness fall on your eyes this morning because everybody thinks somebody else will do it. And I want you to know, uh, thank you so much, you can roll out the red carpet. <laughs> Number one, you must realize today, and this is serious, everyone can but needs to be involved. Every one of us this morning needs to be willing to do something. You can't do everything, but you can do something. You might be sitting there today and thinking, well, you know, my, my tithe of 10 rand doesn't make a difference. No, it absolutely does. You might be sitting there and saying, well, you know, uh, you know I'm not a great musician, but, but I'm sure I can help cars park. Your contribution makes a difference because God always puts you in a place where that place needs what you have. We'll talk about that in, in a little moment this morning. You've got to be willing to do something. Number two, I want you to understand this morning that if you're a leader today, if you're a business owner today, if you're a person of influence today, I want you to know that God expects you and I to serve our community. God has raised you up and put you in that position, not so that you can enjoy uh, rosy beds of ease and, and you can enjoy the best things in life. He's raised you up and He's made you and put you in that place so that you can make a difference where you live. And I want to say to you today, church, pay your staff properly. 
As a leader, if you're a leader spiritually in this community, I want to say to you today, lead with excellence. Do your best. Don't just think about yourself. Let's think about others. How can we make a difference today in the lives of those people around us? If, if you're leading in an NPO, a non-profit organization, or if you're a government official, let me just tell you something, sir, ma'am, if you're a government official, God has placed you there to serve your community. And it's time that we raise up and, and we stand up and we speak the word of God and, and we become the moral conscience and we declare the right things to be done because I want you to know Nehemiah carried the responsibility. When they came to him in chapter 5, the Bible actually says that Nehemiah didn't eat for days. He shortened his rations. He took the resources the king had gave him and he sowed it into Jerusalem so that he could make a difference and help them with the oppression they were facing at that time. Why? Because his focus was to accomplish the goal, was to finish the task, was to do what God told him to do. I want you to know in the world today, it's very interesting that over the last 15 years, they have reduced the world corporately. We have reduced global poverty by more than 18%. Did you hear what I said? We've reduced world poverty by 18%. There are 18% less people that are struggling with poverty because the world over the last 10 to 15 years has become aware of the oppression and the injustices. Here's the sad thing. In South Africa, that hasn't happened yet. The have-nots are increasing and the haves... Sorry, the have-nots are decreasing and the haves are increasing. Church, we've got to rise up and we've got to make a difference. Look at the person next to you and say, it's time to build. All right. Just smile. This is a good message, okay? It's positive. Promise you. I know some of you are sitting there saying, oh my word, uh, did I really want to come to church this morning? Absolutely. Nehemiah 4 and verse 6. So you're getting some help today. I hope, uh, I hope you've been inspired and encouraged uh, this morning. Nehemiah 4 and verse 6. It says, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to, its half, up to half its height. Listen to the next statement. For the people had a mind to work. What happened? The people had a mind to work. I want you to know this statement tells me that there was a unity. There was a decision on behalf of everyone that, listen, whatever the small part is, we're going to do it. I, I remember with fondness the, the first day we started a building program here in this building. How many remember what this church looked like when we took it over? I mean, it was a mess. I should have had one of those photos uh, up on the screens. It was a mess. And I remember about 80 people arrived here in their old clothes, uh, in their tatty shorts and their holy shirts and their gloves and their paintbrushes and their tools. I mean, you know, we spent the whole Saturday cleaning and riding rubble, loads and loads of it. And how many you know, because we had a mind to work, within 30 days we were able to move in to our building. Was it 30 days? I think it was. Eh? We took over um, September and we had our, well, whatever it was. I think it was about 30 days. We moved in here on a Sunday, everything. Shh. Why? Because we had a mind to work. Unity makes a difference. So here's key number three about teamwork. Burdens are lighter when everybody works together towards a common purpose. That's why we present our goals. That's why we've got a mission and a vision so that it's clear. Everything we do every day during the week, the staff, the worship team, the stewards on a Sunday, everybody, we're all working towards one common purpose. And I want to say to you today, we want to finish this building this year. We see our courtyard with a beautiful patio where you can sit and have coffee. We see our children's church with carpets and the latest, um, the latest computer wear and the latest uh, technology so that we can minister to our children. How many can see our ablutions with their ceilings and our beautiful courtyard? How many can see our new sound system where Pastor Larry's voice sounds even better than it does? You're supposed to say, no, Pastor, it sounds amazing. But anyway, you missed that opportunity. No, no, it's fine. It's okay. It's okay. I know Peter likes my voice. It's fine. No, the truth is this. We can all make faster progress and we can accomplish more when everybody has a mind to work. Look at the person next to you and say, have a mind to work. You see, unity creates synergy. And synergy gives you momentum. 
Unity creates synergy and synergy gives you momentum. Let me explain what synergy is. How many of you know if I walked in here today with a motorbike that's in parts and I put all the parts of the motorbike here on the stage, the wheels and the engine and the clutch and the handlebars and the tires and the seat and the petrol tank and I put it all here on the, on the stage. How many of you know I have a motorbike? But the truth is it's not going anywhere. Why? Because I've got to put it together. I've got to assemble all the parts in the right order. And when I assemble them in the right order, then guess what? Then I have a motorbike that can move. That's what synergy is. Synergy is bringing all the parts together so that we can move forward. And how you know, once that bike is put together, I can now start the motor and I can accelerate and I can start to move forward. So momentum is created because there's a synergy because we've all come together in unity. Let's go on. I want to just say this to you today though. If you're a volunteer on every, every level and this is what you need to be to be a volunteer. You've decided to partner with this church. You give regularly to this church. You find ways to serve and to help this church move forward. Then you're a volunteer. And I want to say to you today, thank you for your support. Thank you for having a mind to work. And let's go on because we're not finished yet. Can you say amen? All right, the next one. Let's move along together and let's turn to Nehemiah uh, chapter 4 and we're going to read verses 7 and 8. We're still in Nehemiah 4. Let's read verse 7 and 8. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. Say very angry. And they conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made prayer to God and because of them we began to set watch against them day and night. The next point I want to make this morning is this. You will need to learn to fight your battles while you're building your walls. Nothing of significance and value happens without a fight. Can you say amen? That's why Mandy and I have an amazing marriage. <laughs> Some of you missed that. No, actually we don't fight a lot. I know I joke at church a little bit, but we actually don't fight. We're actually very good. Mandy listens to everything I tell her to do. It's absolutely amazing. She's an amazing wife. <laughs> Key number four. Prayer and studying the Word of God will produce courage and patience in your life, which will enable you to refuse to give up in the face of trouble and even confusion. How many of you can relate that you've been through some trouble lately? How many can relate? There's sometimes where you sit there and you're a little bit confused about actually what it is God wants you to be doing or what it is God is doing. And it's like, why is this taking so long? I mean, God, if you're on my side, I mean, Nehemiah took 52 days. We're in uh, uh, 3,672 days. But you know what, when you study the word and you spend time in prayer and you seek God, it gives you the inward courage to say, you know what, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep patient. I'm going to keep moving forward with the plan that God has for my life. Now you'll understand in a moment what we mean by building the church. And I'll clarify everything as we bring it together in a moment. Ephesians 6. You all know the scripture well, well. From verses 10 through to verse 18, it speaks about putting on the whole armor of God. It's about recognizing that our fight is not a natural fight with each other. It's a spiritual fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wickedness in heavenly places. And the Bible says if you and I will take time to put on the armor of God, we'll be able to stand against the wiles. The word wiles is the strategies of the enemy. The enemy has a strategy to break you down, to destroy and to rob you of the ability to move forward with God's purpose. And here's how he does it. He, he brings disunity. He brings, he brings doubt. He brings questioning into our lives. And then we're all doing our own thing instead of working together as a team towards a, go, a common purpose. It's so important this morning that we understand the power of fervent prayer. I want you to know this morning, I want to address this as your pastor of this local church. I want you to know religion teaches us that prayer is only a quiet, meek time of meditation. Oh pastor, I'm praying this morning. I just 
need to be quiet. Now listen, hear what I said. Religion has taught us that it's only quiet meditation. I'm not saying that that's not part of prayer. It is. But I want you to know there's just some time where you need to stand up and in boldness and confidence declare, devil, back off my space. I'm drawing a, a line in the sand. I will not be quiet. I will not give up. I will not stand for your rubbish. Get out in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said to me, well, God's not deaf. You don't have to shout. No, he's not deaf, but he's not nervous either. And sometimes you've just got to let out a shout and say enough already. Some of you here today, you are putting up with the rubbish and the nonsense that the devil tries to pour on you every day and it's time to rise up in your spirit, man. It's time to pray in tongues and say no more in Jesus' name. I refuse to give in to that in Jesus' name. You say, Pastor, can I give you scripture for that? I'm so glad you asked. Acts chapter 4. Go read it there, man. They were being persecuted from every side. And the Bible says when they were beaten and they were told never to speak in the name of Jesus, they went to their own company and they had a prayer meeting. And the Bible says they prayed so fervently, so loud, so determinedly that the place where they were was shaken. You don't shake places with this kind of prayer. And if that's you when you pray, I'm not mocking you, okay? There are times where you get quiet. I understand. There's times where you just wait on the Lord. But there's times when you rise up in the fiery power. And I want you to know there's a time, like at corporate prayer, where you need to just stand up and lock your horns together in the corporate anointing and take hold of what God has for you. Take hold spiritually of what God's called you to be. Go read it in uh, Romans 8, 26 to 28. Go read Paul in Ephesians 4, 19. He says, man, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Go study that word in the Greek. He's not talking about some mamby-pamby little prayer. Oh, Lord, if it's your will, oh, please bless me. No, it's rising up. Lord, you said in your word that you will bless me. You said that you've given me the strength. And so, Lord, I'm standing on your word and I'm going to take the steps. I'm going to take the, the, the power of your word and I'm going to move forward with my life. Ah, oh, don't shout me down just because I'm preaching good this morning. Oh, we're doing a soccer laduma, sorry. <laughs> ah, shame. Pray for your pastor, he needs help. Yeah, it's hot up here this morning. Nehemiah chapter 3. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 3, the next point. I don't even know which point I'm on, but Nehemiah chapter 3, we're getting close to the beginning of the chapter. Verses 1 and then verses 5. Verse 1 says, Then Elishib, the high, who names their son Elishab? Hmm. The high priest rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated and hung, it, hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred, and they consecrated it. Then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Verse 5. Next to them, the Tikoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. Please underline that. You go home today and read chapter 13. It's the most boring chapter of the Bible. <laughs> but Because uh, all it does is it talks about all the families, the Sheobites and the Mel Melanites and the Habobites and the Hananites and the Megabites. And the <laughs> talk about computer language, my word. But it talks about all the families. Listen, and all of them as families went and they built a section of the, of the wall. It's a beautiful story and it tells you and I that everyone this morning is important. Would you look at the person next to you and say, you are important. Oh, come on, tell them like you really mean it. Come on, you are important. It's a picture, it's a, it's an, it's a boring chapter, but it's actually incredible to see that Nehemiah, through his leadership and his heart of, of passion to get a job done, had rallied families that before were in disarray, were now working together. And the incredible thing is this, because of the enemy, they were building with one hand and they had their sword in the other hand. 
They were like, we dare you to come, St. Ballot. Bring your confusion. Come on, we dare you. Come, come, come. Come, bring it on. Ah, they were fighting with one hand and they were building with the other. Determination. And they worked together to accomplish it. I want you to know, listen carefully this morning. God always places us in a church that needs what we have. You say, no, no, I don't know if I like that, Pastor. <laughs> well, tough luck if you like me or not. If God placed you here, you have something that we need. <laughs> I like the pastor, but you know his wife. Oh, my word. <laughs> Sorry for that. But here's the thing. It's much bigger than personalities. It, it's much bigger than, than the name. Some, some people think Raymer is named after Ray McCauley. I mean, serious. <laughs> Do you really think that? <laughs> Rhema Bible Church. Well, first it would be spelt R-A-H-M-A. Rhema Kauli. Anyway, the word Rhema means, it's a Greek word for the spoken word, the revealed word of God. Anyway, that's another message. But here's the reality. Listen, God places you in the church where what you have they need. Here's the thing. He also places you in the church where they have what you need. And here's what happens in a lot of people's lives because the enemy is very clever, very sly. He has a way of getting people to a place where they take what they need from the church but they never bring what they have and give it to the church. There's always an exchange. Now listen carefully today, church. Partnership is a biblical principle. It's a godly thing. Think about it. When Noah built the ark, God built, brought the animals in two by two, not one by one. When Jesus sent out his disciples to go preach the gospel, he sent them out two by two because he understood the power of partnership the, the Bible says I think in, in uh, um, I think it's in Ecclesiastes one can put a thousand to flight but two can put ten thousand to flight the reality today I'm successful I'm doing what I'm doing not because of me but because someone else saw in me what God saw in me Someone else partnered. Someone else paid the price. Someone else made a sacrifice so that I could be here doing what I'm doing. You never get where you are by yourself. If you think that, you're in pride because you're always there because of someone else that God puts around you to help you. Are you okay with that this morning? Wow, where did the time go this morning? Now, I underline verse 5. It says that the nobles would not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. There are those who just won't do anything. And I want to say to you this morning, guys, we've got to understand today, whether you like to believe it or not, or whether you think it's just preaching, the truth this morning is, your fulfillment of your vision and your purpose and your destiny and your goals is always linked to the local church. Because when you got born again, you became the body of Christ. When you do well, I do well. When I do well, you do well. Can you say amen? That is what partnership is about. Now you can go read in Haggai chapter 1 and, and I'm just going to quickly read a few verses here uh, from verse 2. It says, And then the, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses? while my temple lies in ruins. Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, you bring little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but you're not warm. You earn wages, and you earn wages, and you put it in bags that have holes. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Go to the mountain, bring wood, and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it, and be glorified, 
says the Lord. You go read the rest of the story. It's quite a, quite a wake-up call. But I want to say this to you. You build God a house and He'll build you a house. It's a principle of the kingdom. And I want you to know that whenever I've stretched myself to go to the next level with God, to, to stay fervent with the vision, to stay faithful to the call, to give the extra, to go there. God has never let me down. God has never let us down as a family. The people around me, my mentors, if you look around in the church today, I can point the people out here that have built God a house. God is building their house. Do they have trouble? Yes. Do they go through things? Yes. But they're stable. They're moving on. They're not putting their money in bags with holes in. And I want to say to you this morning, and myself, let, let me address it to us, consider our ways. What is going on in our lives spiritually? Now, let me just quickly say this. I've got a few minutes. You're just going to have to hang in there with me for a few more minutes if you would. Listen this morning. All of us need to consider our ways. When we talk about building the house, the, the small part of that is the building. I understand that. Because you know, when we leave today, this is just a building. The, the house spiritually that you're building is your life. Your walk with God. Building Christ into your life. If you're not spending time reading the Bible, praying, building spiritual awareness into your life, serving God on the principles and values of His Word, then I want you to know you're not building the house. And God is more upset with that than you're not building this house. But I want you to know this house is part of this house. Because this is where I come to get spiritually edified and strengthened and built up. Can you understand that this morning? That's why we want to build a youth ministry. That's why we want to build a great children's church. That's why we want the latest resources. That's why we want our building to look beautiful and excellent. Because we want to be a church in the community that people say, listen, when there's something going on, when we need something, when we need to hear the voice of God, you can go to that church. Not at the exclusion of any other church because every other pastor wants his church to be the best and the greatest and that's fantastic. I hope they reach their goals. But I'm focused on building this church and accomplishing this vision. Can you say amen? And God has put us together to do it as a team. All right, Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18. I want to encourage you today, go download our vision uh, plan on the, sorry, our goals and visions on the internet. If you haven't already, start reading through our goals. Start praying with us together so we can accomplish what God's called us to do. All right, Nehemiah chapter 2. We've got a couple more verses and we're through. Nehemiah 2 verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God which has been good upon me and also the king's word that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Now remember we're going backwards in the story. So this is the second thing that Nehemiah does and it's, it's a very powerful thing but I want to ask you this morning why should I be part of the team? Why should I be part of Team Ramah South Coast Family Church? Well, Nehemiah kind of sums it up for us. He makes this statement, not, not a statement of arrogance or, or a statement of pride, but a statement of faith and humility. He stands up in front of the people of Jerusalem, the children of Israel, the children of God, and he says this, The hand of the Lord is good upon me to build this work. What he's saying is, I'm not doing this on my own mandate. I'm not doing this in my own strength. This is the call of God. This is the anointing. This is the ability God's given me. This is the vision God's given me. I want to stand before you this morning and say to you, I'm not standing in my own ability and strength, but this is the vision that God has given us for this local church. And I want to say to you, the hand of the Lord is good upon us. And you can connect with that vision and your life will be improved. Your life will grow. Your life will be blessed. Not for any other the reason but that God is great. Can you say amen? You see, when it comes to choosing teams, and I think we've got a few up there, you, you can choose your local team. How many of you know you can choose your local team? And I, I personally have uh, my local team, uh, you know, that I've chosen. The Pirates are the best team in South Africa, and, and I've chosen to support them. Can you say amen? But you can choose your team. I mean, if you want to choose a lower team like Kaiser Chiefs or, you know, Sundowns or something like that. If, if you want to choose it. But hang on, when it comes to the nation, you don't have a choice. You choose Bafana Bafana. 
They might not always win. They might have a way of frustrating us and, and getting us to keep on our knees in prayer. But hang on, they are our team. And we will love them and we will support them because they are our team. Can you say amen? And I want you to know today, you've got to make a choice. Because when it comes to vision, sooner or later, you're either in or you're out. There's no in-between when it comes to serving God. Can you say amen? And I want to appeal to you this morning. I want to ask you, jump in and let's build the church. Now, I've got two more points to make. If you read the whole book of Nehemiah, it's not just the first eight chapters. Nehemiah rebuilds the walls. And in rebuilding the walls, he creates an environment that is safe he builds trust with the people and then guess what he does? Phase two, he starts to establish the people's lives. He starts to strengthen the people so now they not only rebuild the walls, they become a nation again. And that's what happens in the church. You see, we've, we've taken 10 years. This October we celebrate 10 years. We've taken 10 years to build the walls. Now we've got to establish ourselves and we've got to start taking ourselves to the next level so that we can start accomplishing and we can become a people that has a voice, that has a message, that has something to say to our community because now we're going to phase two or to level two. Then I want you to know, it didn't end there. After Nehemiah did that, I want you to know he went a step further and he started to speak to the nations. He started to make reforms in the city of Israel where they had idol worship before. He now built temples so they worshipped God. He did reforms and he had influence. So you see, we don't just stop at building the walls. When we finish the church and, and we get ourselves to a place where we're disciples and we're walking, yes, we have challenges and problems, but we don't fall down all the time. Now we can start establishing other people and then we can start having influence in our city and in our nation. The last point this morning, Nehemiah chapter 1. Now, if I had more time, we'd go into it. But here, Nehemiah 1 and verse 5. Now we're at the beginning. We've gone backwards, but we're at the beginning. This is where Nehemiah starts. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that, we, that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you night and day for the children of Israel, your servants. I confess the sins of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Verse 10. Now these your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. Lord, please let your ear be attentive to our prayer, the prayer of your servants and the prayer of your servants for we desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day and I pray that you grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Key number seven to teamwork. It all starts and finishes with prayer and studying your Bible because it will lead you to discover God's plan for your life. I want to ask you today as a church, please don't take this lightly. Please don't take this just as another message. I'm imploring you today, let's pray together and let's ask God to help us to, to arrive at our mission, to be true to our vision and to accomplish the goals that have been set before us this year. And let's pray and ask God for His ears to be open, His eyes to be upon us so that we can move forward in the plan God has for our lives. Every head bowed, every eye closed.